Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to Evening Devotion. Tonight we're going to be reading a very interesting part of 2 Thessalonians 2.16. Everlasting consolation. The whole verse says, and this is the closing. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father, who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. I'm not going to actually not going to read the context above this because this is a closing, a greeting, a farewell, I guess. Um, everything above this is on a different subject. But how interesting. Everlasting consolation. That's interesting. He's given us an everlasting consolation. What is that? Consolation. There's music in the word. Like David's harp, it charms away the evil spirit of melancholy. It was a distinguished honor to Barnabas to be called the son of consolation. Nay, it is one of the illustrious names of a greater than Barnabas. For the Lord Jesus is the consolation of Israel. Everlasting consolation. Here is the cream of it all. For the eternity of comfort is the crown and glory of it. What is the everlasting consolation? It includes a sense of pardoned sin. A Christian man has received in his heart the witness of the Spirit that his iniquities are put away like a cloud, and his transgressions like a thick cloud. If sin be pardoned, is not that an everlasting consolation? Next, the Lord gives his people an abiding sense of acceptance in Christ. The Christian knows that God looks upon him as standing in union with Jesus. Union to the risen Lord is a consolation of the most aiding, sorry, a most abiding order. It is, in fact, everlasting. Let sickness prostrate us. Have we not seen hundreds of believers as happy in the weaknesses of disease as they would have been in the strength of hail and blooming health? Let death's arrow pierce us to the heart. Our comfort dies not. For have not our ears full often heard the songs of saints as they have rejoiced because of the living love of God was shed abroad in their hearts in dying moments? Yes, a sense of acceptance in a beloved is an everlasting and the beloved is an everlasting consolation. Moreover, the Christian has a conviction of his security. God has promised to save those who trust in Christ. The Christian does trust in Christ, and he believes that God will be as good as his word and will save him. He feels that he is safe by virtue of his being bound up with the person and work of Jesus. Look at the wording here. You're saved. That's it. You're saved. It's everlasting. It's forever. Everything that was done for us at the moment of salvation is forever. Nothing will change that. You know, the world gets us caught up in all this, all these thoughts of, I'm condemned, I'm doomed, the Lord can't possibly save me, doesn't love me, I've sinned myself out of the, out of the kingdom, all this stuff. It's like, when did you come to a place where you thought you were more powerful than him? He is far more powerful than we are the most powerful. And so if he saves us, we're saved. No matter what we do, no matter where we walk, no matter what activities we engage in, we're saved. If you're saved, you're saved. The question isn't, can Jesus do it? The question is, are we saved in the first place? But look at what comes with salvation. A consolation that is everlasting. Truth with no limit. Something that transcends everything in this earth. And so when they talk, when they chide us, when they go back and forth, when they all these things that, that people do trying to kind of wrestle these things out. The fact of the matter is, is that it's a consolation that is everlasting. It is truth beyond our understanding. It is peace. It is joy. The peace that defies all understanding, the joy inexpressible. It is something that we can't fully grasp. One of the reasons why we have hope is because we can't grasp it. One of our hopes is to learn more about this as time goes on. We're a part of a group of people throughout all of human history that all wondered and hoped for the same thing. I hope to learn more about this. We know a kingdom waits for us in heaven. We know a new life waits for us. We know a Lord waits for us. We know a Father in heaven waits for us. And things beyond our imagination wait for us. And this is a consolation. We know true, pure, 100% forgiveness is ours. 
I mean, what, what do we hear the other people preaching out there? Better make sure you don't sin. You telling me my sin is too powerful for him to save me? Better make sure you do this and do that. Better make sure you're tithing. Better make sure you fall down on your knees. Better make sure you're an orthodox. Better make sure that you're paying attention to all these laws. Better make sure you're honoring these feast days. You know, you better make sure you're dressing right, walking right, acting right. The Holy Spirit will lead you into a, a, a activity that you can't, you don't even control. You don't even fully understand it until you get there. The Holy Spirit will lead you. And those that are being led by the Holy Spirit are a law unto themselves. That's what the Bible says. The New Testament says. Amazing. The world wants us condemned and scared out of our wits. I heard somebody the other day talk about uh, some friends of theirs that they had entertained. And um, they were all talking. They were sitting around the table and they were talking. And they decided they were going to take their Bible out. And they were going to read their Bible. And they said, these people are Catholic. And they just cried and moaned that they were about to read the Bible because in Catholicism, they teach you don't, you can't read the Bible unless there's a pastor or preacher or bishop there to teach you what about what you're reading. And so you're not allowed to read the Bible. And they were just torn apart that they were pulling the Bible out to read it. That's terrible. That word is the common man's word. It was made for us. It was made to give us hope, something we can read and understand. And as the Lord grows our, grows our intelligence, grows our wisdom and understanding, then our grasp of the word grows at the same time. They go hand in hand. People out there in the world today preaching false doctrines and false gospels are going out, out of their way to Condemn people, make them feel guilty about being a Christian. Make them feel terrible about believing the truth. Make them feel ashamed. Why? The Bible is true. The Bible is clear. The Bible is simple if you just read it. But not read it looking for your understanding. Read it looking for his. And then take his understanding as yours. Not me, not another man, not some book. Take his understanding as yours. You only do that by reading the Bible. You only do that by studying for yourself, which is what was what it was intended to be. What a terrible, terrible state that the church is in today that they find excuses. They find excuses to let every form of heresy propagate and prosper. Instead of just believing the word of God, where our everlasting consolation lies, if we but hold to this truth, if we can hold on to this truth, we do well. Problem is we can't hold on to it. Well, those of us that believe, those of us that are standing in the gap, those of us that are here, we believe. We know this word is true and we trust it and we're following it because it's our Lord in writing. We believe it. We trust him. Our everlasting consolation is we will stand on the day of redemption before him in glory. And all that goes along with that. Can every Christian on the planet say they have that consolation? I doubt it. And when you engage with them in, in, in concourse, you know, in, in, in some kind of discourse, and you tell them, my consolation is the Lord. He is my all in all, my everything. Whether I'm doing it right or doing it wrong, whether I'm standing where I should be or doing what I should be, regardless, I'm my consolation is in the Lord because I have faith, because I believe. Oh no, you've got to do this, 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 this. this. You've got to be this, 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 this. Really? And they blame me for preaching works? And look at the stuff that's coming out of their mouths. If you're not doing this, you're not a believer. Really? And they say, I'm preaching works. Hmm. Our everlasting consolation is that Jesus Christ is returning for his children. Hebrews 9, 28. 
He is coming a second time apart from salvation for uh, I'm sorry, apart apart from sin for salvation. Two thousand years ago he came for sin. Two thousand years later he's coming for his church. Seven years after that, give or take. He's coming back for his kingdom. Our consolation is that our Lord knows who we are and he's coming for us. No debate. No discussion to be had here. The Bible stands firm on this. And the bulk of scripture confirms it. No one else has anything to say about this. They try, but they they have nothing. And that's the way it should be. They, we shouldn't have anything to say against this. Somebody is using scripture to refute scripture. They don't have the consolation. If somebody is trying to twist scripture to match what they want it to match, they have no consolation. If somebody is trying to change doctrine to mean something that justifies them, basically self-justification, which the Bible condemns, they have no consolation. Who has the consolation? Those that accept and receive the word of God gladly and with thankfulness and live according to its precepts. Being a doer of the word, a Berean in study, it's that simple. You and I, we have the consolation, this everlasting consolation of Christ Jesus. Most of the world doesn't. And I include the quote-unquote Christian church because the bulk of the church, of what, what we would call the church or what the world calls the church, they're not in the right place. They're not standing in the right place. They don't have the consolation. That's why they're miserable. That's why you can't tell the difference between them and somebody from the secular world. Who can you tell the difference in? The true believers. But they never pay us any attention. That's why they can't tell. They're looking at the television. They're going to the big churches. Where everybody's rich, good looking. Women go there to meet men with money. Men go there to meet trophy wives. None of them go there for Jesus Christ. More and more, the churches are losing their way. More and more, the buildings, the people in them are losing their way. They're going the ways of everyone in the Bible who was lost. Why? There's no need for that. We have the more sure word in the palm of our hand. We can literally access it everywhere. Why are we going the wrong direction? Why is, is it the body of true believers is so small? It's shockingly small. When you really get down to it, it's a lot smaller than what we believe. I've heard several people who are, are who have been in this for a while. They have major programs, radio hosts, talk about, you know, they talk about, well, how many people do you think is going to go? You know, it could be around 50 million. I'm like, I agree. I think they're 100% right on the money, or right around 50 million. That, that's terrible because there's 8 billion in the world. There's supposed to be 2.7 billion Christians in the world today, but when you take all the nonsense out of the picture, when you take all the heresy, all the false doctrine, all the false converts, all the false professors, and you pull it all out, you're down to less than 3% of that number. Less than 3% of 2.7 billion. Shocking. Shocking. Ladies and gentlemen, we have the everlasting consolation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation in him and him alone. When God looks at us, he sees him. We have that. We are saved. We will stand with him in glory because that's what he told us would happen if we believed. Continue believing. Hold on to your faith. Hold on to what you have that no one take your crown, just like Jesus said. Remember your first love. And let's keep waiting and watching as the world does what it does. Let's keep waiting and watching for him because he is worthy of our love. He's worthy of our adoration. He's worthy of our faith. And he's worthy of our thanks, thanksgivings. He is worthy. Let us proclaim him worthy. Lord, you are worthy. You are worthy of everything. May we give it to you. May we give you what we have. May we give you what you desire from us. And may we be the people of the everlasting consolation. 
When the world is turning its back on you, Lord, make us to stand even stronger. For your glory. Amen. Guys, thank you for joining me for evening devotion. Don't let the world turn you away and make you feel guilty or shame you away from the truth. Stand your ground. You know the truth. You know the truth. And the truth shall set you free. I love you all very much. I'll bless you all in Jesus' name, and I'll see you in the next video.